Hello, welcome to this edition of Great Gardens. Today we're going to talk about that special plant in your yard and when you have a situation where it's too big for the area but you want to save it and bring it to another area in your yard, so how to transplant a, a special plant is what this show is about. And I'm going to go through the whole steps of how you carefully dig it and move it so that it succeeds in its new location. So what we have to work with, this is the subject matter, is an umbrella pine or Cydopides verticillata is the Latin name, but commonly known as the umbrella pine. It's a very unique key plant in that it's got this very, very thick needle, something you'd associate with areas down to the south of Massachusetts or down into Florida, but it thrives up to zone five or maybe even zone four up here in New England. And uh, we're standing in a field at Western Nurseries where we have a whole row of these. They um, grow very slow. And this plant here was started from a, a rooted cutting probably, I'm going to say, 12, 14 years ago. And now it's about a four to five foot specimen plant. So the first thing we have to do when we transplant a key plant is to tie up the branches so you can see where the trunk is and get your, your spade in. I'm going to grab some rope and do that right now. I like to do it with a slip knot or a loop knot. First thing I have to do is cut it to the, the right length. And again, all I want to do here is to tie it up lightly so that the branches uh, hold up. And this one I, I can probably reach right around the lower branches, go through the slip or through the loop here. Don't pull it too tight, you don't want to break anything. And I want to focus on getting those lower branches out of the way mostly. Use my leg to keep it pressed in and then work my way up to the middle of the of the uh, of the plant and then just tie it off. And that should hold. Now I can see right where the trunk is right here. Now typically the plant's been in the ground for a few years and you need to find where the root flare is and there's a lot of buildup of needles and soil and of course in our beautiful New England nursery soils here we got a lot of rocks. But I want to find that, that trunk just using my hand at first. And then what's known as shaving next. This rock is going to be an issue so I want to get that out of the way. And then the shaving takes place where you just kind of, the key is when you transplant something is to take your time and you want to come out with a nice root ball where all the roots are intact. And this is what I'm going to do is just go through these steps one at a time. And the first thing is shaving it around quite a bit away from the, about a two inch trunk, inch and a half trunk. So my root ball is going to be about uh, 18 inches. Every inch caliper trunk is about 10 inch root ball diameter. So about 18 inch root ball is what I should end up with here. I'm just going to go around the plant and shave it. I'm shaving it down at an angle already forming the structure of the ball a little bit. And I'm starting to feel the roots with the, the spade a little bit now. And I can see them here, little fibrous roots. A lot of times you're not going to know if the root system is fibrous or not. This tends to have a fairly fibrous root system, meaning that it's going to hold, the root ball is going to hold intact a little better versus something like a U, 
which has big thick roots or some deciduous trees and don't have a lot of fibrous root system systems, those are harder to dig. Okay, so I've shaved it down to where I can see the, the roots and the shape of the root ball now. And I've also, in doing that, kind of created additional width because there's going to be a trench around here. Like I said, you want to do this one step at a time and you don't want to be forcing it out too quickly. <clears throat> so the next thing that we do is kind of get that spade, get that spade in the ground to form the side of the root ball. Just picking away soil and I'm starting to chop through some of those fibrous roots, not any roots bigger than really uh, a quarter inch in diameter. <clears throat> By the way, what I'm using is a spade here. And the spade works well because it's going to come in handy when we wedge out the plant. But also it's the best tool for making these nice angular cuts versus a rounded shovel would kind of leave it not as, uh, not as smooth as I'm making this root ball right here. So if you can get a, get a good spade at your local independent garden center, uh, that would be the best tool to use or borrow from a neighbor. So I've got this root ball nicely outlined, about 18 inches diameter. And what I want to do next is get the spade down a little deeper using my foot. I don't really want to wiggle it yet. That's the next step. I just want to get all those, you can see it moves a little bit, so I'm still cutting through some roots here. So as I go around and get those bottom roots loosened up, I'm starting to wiggle it a little bit now. And you can see that the ball so far, I'm doing a pretty good job of staying intact. Now I'm going all the way around. I'm going to wiggle it a little more. Now I'm actually starting to wedge it. And I can tell at this point that I've got it loosened up because it's starting to tilt. So that's the step of loosening up the root ball. And the next thing I'll show in a minute is how to get it out of the hole. A couple ways to do that in burlap. So because this umbrella pine probably weighs about 150, 175 pounds with the soil being wet, I'm going to do, I'm going to get this onto the burlap in the hole here. So what I'm going to do is take my 48 inch burlap in this case, wrap it in half and stick that right down as far as I can and then carefully tilt the tree and get it under there as much as I can. and then pull it back this way and see if I can pull it through the other side. And try to center it without the root ball crumbling apart too badly. A few rocks in there. And I think that's pretty well centered. And I find it's a little easier to lift now. I could either tie it in the hole or lift it outside, but I'll probably see if I can lift this thing up myself. If I could. And I'll tie it outside the hole in this case. So the root ball stayed intact pretty well here. You can see all the fibrous root systems. By the way, I should mention the time to do this. It's fall right now, but this can be done in the fall or in the spring before the new growth starts. And that's true with most evergreens and deciduous trees. That's the time of year to transplant. Here in Massachusetts, April is a great time to do it. So I'm gonna take 
two corners. Nice and tight. I don't have to tie this very tight. And then the other two corners. And this one I do want to get tighter. Oh, okay. Untie it again. Boy, did a good job here. Oh no! Oh, you're doing fine right there. You're tying it. Okay. So that's a nice tight root ball. Now the soil will stay in place. And at this point, I could have just left two corners tied, had a friend, and bring it over to where it's going to be planted. But I'm going to assume I'm not ready with my hole yet. And this is going to be incorporated into a bigger landscape job. So I'm actually going to keep this above ground for a few weeks until my landscape crew shows up. So I'm going to root, I'm actually going to drum lace this because I just want the root ball to stay intact and when I water it and everything it'll stay intact better. So I'm going to show you how to drum lace the root ball which really gets it solid. And this is what nurseries do when they buy in plants that are dug with spades like this. They'll, you'll see the rope around the edge of the root ball. I'm going to grab about three arm lengths here. I'm going to tie that slip knot or loop knot again. It's not really a slip knot, it's a loop knot. I'm going to lean the plant, the plant down and I'm going to go through itself. Actually, I can tell it's been a while. What I meant to do is go around this way. And pull it tight, and then I want to go around the other the other two sides. And tie back onto itself. And tie it off. Then I go around the sides. This is a matter. of grabbing onto the next vertical, pulling it tight, rolling it over, next one, pull it tight, one more time, back to where I started, and then tie it off. And that's it. That will, again, use your knees when you lift. That will stand up. It's flat on the bottom, and the root ball will stay intact for weeks. So as long as you keep it watered, pretty much every day when it's above ground like this, as long as it's above 50 degrees, you can leave this above ground and the plant will continue to thrive. Now that we've got the plant dug, it, we need to lift it onto the truck. We're going to transport this to a neighbor's yard, and I'm going to need some help. So thankfully, our show director, Mike Tarosian, is here. How are you, Mike? Doing great, Pete. And we're going to have him help, because it's always good to have two people lift something that weighs about 150 pounds. It might be a little awkward. And we want to use our knees. We want to put one hand in the back, one hand underneath the rope that we just tied off. And Mike, you ready? Yep. One, two, three, up. Just like that. And then I always like to let the plant do the work at this point. Why use your back muscles unnecessarily? Just get it on enough so that it's on like that. Okay, now we've got it on the truck. And it's important to know that the plant 
will be fine transporting it to your neighbor's house or wherever you're bringing it as long as it doesn't roll around too much. So, and I also like to leave the root ball right toward the back. Why create more work for yourself having to pull it further on the other end? So the first thing we'll do is just lean it down. And I use the tailgate as a, uh, as a wedge too, so it doesn't roll backwards that way. I usually grab a couple bricks or rocks just so it won't roll this way. Now, this is fall, but if we're in the summer, or even in the fall, if I were going far, I would, I would definitely use a tarp. The constant wind on uh, evergreens will, will desiccate or dry out uh, the moisture that's in the needles. So it's important to know when you're traveling down the highway for a half an hour, or even 10 minutes, you don't want that constant wind and you, you would want to put even a, a tarp with holes on it, deadens the wind. It can be any, any cheap tarp you have around to, to clean up your leaves in the fall, the, the, the plastic ones, the burlap ones, it doesn't matter, but you do want to cover it. So now that it's in there, I've used the wall, I've used the back, I've used the bricks to wedge it. Um, all we do is close the tailgate and we're off. So what I want everyone to know is it's pretty easy to, to do this. You have um, the strength, you're, you're halfway there, then all you need are the tools. We used rope, we used a piece of burlap, and uh, the spade is really all you need to do uh, to successfully move plants around your own yard. And I think that's an important thing for people to know how to do because so oftentimes uh, you'll buy a $50 plant that outgrows its spot and now it's worth $250. And for very little work, this literally took me 15, 20 minutes, I can have that plant dug out and move to another spot. And uh, you've, you've kept the value of your, your landscape intact. So I hope you enjoyed that this segment today. We're going to go see Ann Wells on Did You Know? Hi, you just saw those beautiful ceodophytus being dug. I want to give you some tips for successful fall planting. Um, I want you to know, first of all, that we have on our website watering guidelines and planting guidelines. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. You can download these, you can take a look at them, and you can have them for handy reference. So let's say you've got your hole perfectly dug, and you want to make sure that uh, you, know, you do follow the guidelines. The first thing as a tip that I would recommend is that you actually water that hole. Fill it up with water, let it drain out completely, and then set your plant and go on with the planting process. Um, you learn a lot about how quick the drainage is and all kinds of good stuff by actually watering that hole, not least of which is making the area damp enough so the new roots will want to wander. You want to consider using a good planter starter, a plant starter, especially with a fall planting, I think, because it's a nice idea to encourage rooting as quickly as possible. Um, we carry two products we like an awful lot. One is a granular that has uh, actually mycorrhizae in it, which is a nice help uh, you can look up mycorrhizae online. Um, and then we have a liquid starter, the difference being that this is just fertilizer. And it actually is a very nice, quickly accessible form because it's a liquid. Easy to use, both of these products. So use a nice starter. Then you get it all planted neatly, water again. Water that whole area so the water goes right down through the root ball and out into the surrounding soil. Now with a fall planting, something you might want to consider is using an anti-desiccant spray. The most common brand probably out there is Wiltproof. Um, it's sort of like chapstick for plants. Once the ground freezes, your plant can't take up any more water, and it can only hang out in loose water, similar to the way our lips and hands chop. So this is a waxy coating, wears off after a while. Um, so it's a great temporary protection. Think of it like chapstick for plants. Make sure, biggest tip of all, that you water regularly for that fall planting as late into the winter as you possibly can. In Massachusetts, no matter what the weather, whether it's snow, sleet, whatever, the soil usually doesn't freeze until late December. And for all that time, the plant still needs to take up water. Once the ground freezes in late December, then it's got to just stand there and it can only lose moisture. So don't put that garden hose away. Really important, especially for a fine specimen Cyadopidus, to make sure that you haul that hose out, water once a week, about two gallons per foot of height. And I think they'll come out beautifully in the spring. Thanks.
Thank you, Ann. That was very helpful. I hope you enjoyed the show today, and uh, thank you for watching this segment. If you have any questions or things you'd like us to cover on future shows, send us an email. We'll see you next time. Hello, welcome to HCAM Insights. Did you know that Hopkinton's television station has its very own newscast? Just like one of those big shot TV stations up in Boston. Ours is just like theirs, but all our news is about Hopkinton. Look for newscasts, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, airing at 6 and 10 p.m. In one half hour, we'll keep you up to date on everything Hopkinton. Not a good time for you? Not to worry. All the latest is also online at hcam.tv. I'm Dr. Nancy Rappaport. Suicide is a difficult topic to discuss, but one that needs open communication. Suicide is the third leading cause of death among 10 to 24 year olds, and it's on the minds of far too many young people. A national survey of high school students discovered that one in seven said that they were seriously considering taking their own lives. Deaths from suicides are only part of the problem. Every year, some 150,000 youth receive emergency care for self-inflicted wounds. Suicide leaves family and friends shocked and confused with unanswered questions about what might have been done to avoid such tragedies. Research has allowed us to identify risk factors, warning signs, causes of suicide, and strategies for prevention. Visit the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention at AFSP.org to learn more. Eighty. Thirty. Fifty. Every mile brings us closer. Twenty-five. Every mile in a city near you. Seventy-five. Help us stop diabetes. A hundred. Join the Tour de Cure. Sixty. Register to ride. Thirty-six. Or sponsor a rider. Fifty. Call 1-888-DIABETES or visit us online at diabetes.org forward slash tour. How many miles will you ride? 25. Hello, welcome to HCAM Insights. Did you know that Hopkinton's television station has a virtual plethora of virtual methods to keep you connected to everything Hopkinton? In addition to our TV channels and website, we have a monster Facebook presence, daily email updates, a Twitter account, an RSS feed, and a little button for Google+. And yes, I don't know what that one does either. But anyway, if it's Hopkinton's social media you're looking for, you're looking for HCAM. I'm Dr. Pamela Weinfeld. I'm Dr. Lewis Kushner. Our skin is the largest organ in our body and serves many functions, including protection, shock absorption, and temperature control. It's also subject to many disorders and diseases. Today, about one in three people suffer from skin ailments resulting in pain, disfigurement, or disability. The most serious of these conditions is melanoma, a potentially deadly skin cancer that affects some 115,000 people each year. Its incidence continues to rise, but the good news is that if detected early, melanoma is highly curable. Recognizing changes in your skin is the best way to detect melanoma, so examine your skin regularly. If you notice changes in a mole or other unusual conditions, contact your primary care provider. Avoiding excessive exposure to the ultraviolet rays of the sun is the most important step you can take to prevent skin cancer. Using sunscreen, wearing protective clothing, and avoiding tanning beds are important preventive measures. For more information on skin cancer and skin disease, visit skincarephysicians.com. Hi, I'm Rosie Greer. As a former NFL player, I know the value of teamwork. That's why I'm here with my friend and prostate cancer survivor, Charlie Wilson. Each year, more than 32,000 die from prostate cancer. African American men are 60% more likely to be diagnosed with the disease and more than twice as likely to die from it. Caught early, this cancer is highly treatable. If you're over 40, man up. Speak to your doctor about your prostate health. The Prostate Cancer Foundation is leading the way in discovering better treatments and cures. Together, we can take aim against prostate cancer. No one seems to notice, but I've got a lot of pressure in my life. I'm still looking for my first real job. I've changed apartments several times, and my roommates have always been nothing but trouble. Now, because of the economy, I've had to move back home. My mom always makes things worse. When she gets drunk, she starts yelling and tells me that nothing I do is ever good enough, that everything I do is going to fail. 
The next day, she tells me how much she loves me, but that's just more pressure. I get into arguments with her about her drinking. It's an impossible situation. My dad goes to Al-Anon meetings. I didn't think Al-Anon would work for me, but I tried it, and it was better than I thought. I feel better after I go. I'm meeting people I can talk to, and I'm starting to see some real hope. If someone's drinking bothers you, you might find help in an Al-Anon family group meeting right here in our community. I found support there. You can too. Call 1-888-4-ALANON or visit alanonfamilygroups.org. Hello, welcome to HCAM Insights. Did you know that Hopkinton's television station has a special online calendar called the Hopkinton Planner? What makes it so special is that it is updated and kept timely by the community groups dedicated to making Hopkinton the great place that it is. Here at HCAM, we strive to power the communications of our local clubs and organizations, and this is one important way we do that. So please, check it out. If you are the parent of an 11 or 12 year old, you need to know about preteen vaccines. Vaccines that can protect your preteen from meningitis, whooping cough, and for girls, the virus that causes cervical cancer. So schedule a checkup for your child today. Whether it's infectious disease, severe weather, or a chemical spill, emergencies that threaten our public health can happen at any time. After the events of 9-11, the federal government established the Medical Reserve Corps to respond to emergencies. Today in the Commonwealth, 45 Corps units recruit and train both medical and non-medical volunteers. In addition, the Department of Public Health's MSAR program, or Massachusetts System for Advanced Registration, credentials and deploys healthcare professionals to respond in such emergencies. Now a new effort is underway to enhance emergency response by aligning the activities of both groups. Mass Response is designed to facilitate emergency medical response and promote local partnerships in planning and assistance. And you, health professionals and concerned citizens alike, can be part of this important effort. For more information on Mass Response and how to get involved, visit maresponse.org. Hello, welcome to HCAM Insights. Did you know that Hopkinton's television station has a sister website called seeninhopkinton.org? This site hosts online photo albums of everyday life and events in our community. Town residents have contributed thousands of photos of school events, holiday happenings, storms, and life. So far, we've had over 250,000 views of the photos, so if you haven't been there, check it out and think about sending in your own scene.